program here at the Aspen Institute. It is my delight to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation, Better Care Through Better Jobs, Improving Training and Employment for Direct Care Workers. This is in the, the second conversation in our, our series on reinventing low-wage work. In this series, we look at fast-growing low-wage jobs, and we're trying to highlight the challenges, the growth in these kinds of jobs, present for workers, for their families, and for our society, and consider ideas, whether through public practice, through um, private initiatives, that can think about how these challenges might be addressed. Does it really have to be this way? Uh, tomorrow is um, May 4th, and some of you may know it's when we see the next monthly jobs report released. Um, Early betting is that it's not going to be that good. <laughs> uh, and probably not anywhere near the kinds of job creation we need to reemploy the still nearly 13 million Americans who are still looking for work. Given the serious employment deficit, it's not surprising that another trend uh, kind of escapes notice, and which is that the jobs that are being created are oftentimes very low wage jobs. Last month, Bloomberg Briefing noted that over 40 percent of the jobs created in low-wage sector, uh, created since 2010, have been in low-wage sectors. And that as a consequence, household spending remains weak and our prospects for accelerating the growth of our economy are dimmer. So these challenges are interrelated and addressing the challenges of a rapidly growing low-wage work is a crucial conversation if we're going to be serious about how to grow a healthy economy which truly offers economic opportunity to all of those who are willing to work for it. I should note that much of my own work over the past decade has been in the vein of addressing high skill issues and how can people get the skills they need to get to high skill, high wage jobs. And indeed, that's a critical issue for our workforce. Um, yet it is hard to see how those employed in low wage jobs will ever have the time or resources available to them to actually improve their skills and get to these better jobs. But more importantly for the particular conversation we want to have today is that these low-wage jobs, caring for our elderly, our parents, grandparents, or disabled siblings or children, are really important jobs. They're not jobs that are going to go away. They're jobs that somebody has to do and somebody will do. And we really need to think about how we organize and reward that kind of work. Direct care occupations are expected to add over one and a half million jobs in the coming decade. And yet they're among the lowest paid jobs with few benefits and uncertain hours. So the question before us is, does it have to be this way? And this is what we'll be talking about today. We have a terrific panel to talk about it, and I'm really excited to introduce them. And before I do that, I do need to give the regrets of Rachel Garber Monroe, the president of the Weinberg Foundation, who had really hoped to be with us today, but had an urgent personal matter to deal with and was not, unable to make it. She sends her deep regrets and says this is in no way a reflection on Weinberg's interest or commitment to these areas. The Weinberg Foundation's two largest areas of grant making are in caring for older adults and in workforce development. And she, we really regret that we won't have their voice represented today. On the upside, however, we have a terrific panel, and I will introduce them now. And in particular, I want to thank Lainey Romero Alston of the Ford Foundation, who is to my far left. Um, and uh, <laughs> she leads the Ford Foundation's Next Generation Workforce Strategies. You have her bio and all the speaker bios in your packet, so I don't want to spend too long uh, introducing them because I want to let them speak. But I would like to say that Lainey has a long commitment to the issues confronting low-income workers, and she's really an exemplar of the Ford Foundation's values of supporting broad-based economic opportunity, and I thank you particularly for your flexibility. <laughs> uh, Lainey's joined on the panel by, I'm not going in the right order here, uh, by Steve Dawson, president of PHI, I'll try to go in order, uh, who has a long and deep experience in the issues confronting direct care workers. I've known Steve for, for many years. I've had the privilege of learning a tremendous amount from him about the complexities of direct care work and the possibilities for improving these jobs in ways that improve the quality of care and the quality of lives of the, of the workers. Um, we also have with us today Marky Flannery, who is president of Partners in Care, which is the largest licensed home care agency in the New York City region, which in turn is one of the largest markets for this care in the country. So it's really terrific that we have somebody of Marky's expertise um, on our panel today to really comment about how this work really happens. And finally, I'm delighted that, to have E.J. Dion with us as our moderator. Um, 
E.J. Dion probably needs no uh, introduction. I'm sure many of you know him, have seen him. He's a nationally known columnist, commentator, author, and political expert. He is a long friend of the Aspen Institute. Um, and at the Aspen Institute, we like, to, we like to think of our discussions as being values-based discussions, and that makes E.J. just a perfect moderator for this. E.J. is somebody who, who not only thinks deeply about the issues and has tremendous political savvy, but he also thinks about how these issues relate to our values. And, um, and so I, I thank him for being here and for leading this discussion. And I, I do have to mention, and it's, and it's funny because um, E.J. does have a book out, Our Divided Political Heart, and I was thinking how perfect for somebody who leads with his heart. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, I have to also now bear with me, quote my boss, Walter Isaacson, who says about this book, this is a brilliant book about America's current political divide, but more importantly, it's an insightful exploration of our nation's history and our ability to balance individualism with community. That sense of balance has been lost, and this book shows how we can restore a shared appreciation for our historic values. So I think Walter understands that EJ leads with his values, too. So I thank you all for being here, and I'm now going to turn it over to EJ, who will lead us in this afternoon's discussion. Thank you so much. That was so sweet of you, Maureen, after <laughs> Walter kindly gave me that blurb. The book is out in about three weeks, uh, by the way. After Walter gave me that blurb, I felt I had to agree to moderate about 5,000 <laughs> Aspen panels over the next uh, 20 years. Um, and that was so much nicer, the introduction I once got, which ended, and now we, I was out of town, and now for the latest dope from Washington, <laughs> here's E.J. Dion. so thank you. Um, and thanks, I'm honored to be on this great panel. I'm really grateful to Aspen for working so much in this area. I mean, if you care about inequality in the country, if you care about social justice, you have to care and think about and try to find solutions for the people who do uh, low-wage work. And we really do have some of the best people in the country here. And I want to dedicate, actually, my modest participation in this panel to a wonderful woman many of you know, uh, knew, called Beth Shulman. Um, and as we ponder these uh, discussions, it's worth remembering that Beth, who died in uh, 2010, literally wrote the book on this. Some of you know her book, The Betrayal of Work, uh, How Low-Wage Jobs Fail 30 Million Americans. It was a really important book. It's still an important book, and I appreciate very much that uh, Aspen is continuing to work in, the, in her uh, tradition. Um, I want to start by asking Steve. Steve, by the way, uh, is the Steve Jobs of this area with a less complicated <laughs> personality, we'll say. Um, but um, I first met Steve when I visited PHI uh, in the Bronx. It must be 10 or 15 years ago. Years ago. The time um, <coughs> uh, they employed about 500 people now, Steve tells me, they're up to 2,000. It's really, you should all go visit mm -hmm. him uh, in the Bronx. Uh, and I'd like to ask Steve to start us off by talking uh, about the day and the life of the direct care worker, the challenges, uh, the opportunities, and talk about what your organizations, sure. I think plural, really, uh, have done in this area. Happy to. So the direct care workforce, these are the mostly women who uh, care for your loved ones. They're the home health aides, the certified nurse aides, the personal care workers. Uh, they help uh, with the tasks that we take for granted every day, but uh, many need to just um, live independently at home or in the nursing home. Uh, the transferring from bed to chair, feeding, bathing, that's very, very intimate work. And uh, the tasks are different, different titles, but the tasks are fairly similar, uh, but the setting differs a lot. If someone's working in a nursing home uh, as a frontline worker, um, the, while the tasks are the same, they're dealing with a number of different residents all at once. They're having to respond to call bills across the hall. Uh, it can be very pressured in that regard. Uh, if, you're, if you're a direct care worker in the home, uh, it's different. It's, it's more one-on-one, -on -one, but it can be very isolating. You're really on your own. Uh, you don't have a nurse right behind you to help out if something happens right away. Uh, so it can be a, a very challenging job. And well, it's often called a low-wage job, but it's certainly not a low-skill job. It, uh, it requires a type of emotional intelligence, uh, negotiation. You walk into a stranger's home. Uh, you don't know what you're going to find. You don't know if you're going to be dealing with a, a someone who's very disoriented, um, uh, frightened, angry that they're having to have care, um, maybe dealing with a, 
with a son or a, some other relative who wants them to do you to do laundry rather than um, care for their loved ones. So it can be um, quite a challenge. We'll probably be talking more about home care workers today because we, we have Marky, fortunately, with us who runs the largest home care company in the universe, not just New York City. <laughs> so, uh, she knows. She knows. Um, New Gingrich I, actually says there are some on the moon that are big. <laughs> 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 We've got to go. <laughs> God bless Newt. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one thing I would also add is just that the scale of this workforce is incredibly important. That we're talking about uh, including home care workers and nursing home workers. We're talking about over 3.3 million workers now. Um, and the personal care and home care workers are projected to be the f first and second fastest growing occupations in the country. So uh, by the 2020, there'll be over 5 million of these workers. There'll be more, more uh, direct care workers than there are, teachers K through 12, or policemen on the street. It, it's a gargantuan workforce and it uh, therefore um, it employs even today one out of 12 low wage workers is a direct care worker in the United States. So if you're thinking about having impact on uh, low income communities and particularly women um, uh, workers, there's, there's no other workforce, no other set of occupations more important. Uh, so the scale is important on the, on the huge side, uh, but the intimacy is really important in terms of how, how important this job is as a lifeline for people between their homes. PHI, just really quickly, uh, we're based in the South Bronx. We do three things. We build models of uh, high road employers and high road training programs, and our flagship is uh, Cooperative Home Care Associates in the South Bronx, which uh, EJ visited 10 years ago. And uh, that's the largest, it's a worker-owned home care agency, so the aides are the owners of the company. It's the largest worker cooperative in the country. Uh, so we, and, and runs its own <coughs> employer-based training program. We uh, train over 500 women a year. Uh, but then we've taken that knowledge and applied it to other uh, home care agencies and nursing homes. So we work as, as technical assistants to other agencies, work with Marquis Organization in New York and many outside of the city and then since this is such a publicly funded uh, set of occupations, public policy is incredibly important and so uh, much of our work is advocacy and public policy work both in the states in New York and other states and f federally we have an office here, Carol Regan is, directs that office with Gail McInnes. Um, so we have a, a, a federal role as well. Thank you very much. Um, Lane, uh, why don't you talk about why we really have to care about the quality of jobs in uh, direct care and talk about what Ford, which has a really strong interest in a whole lot of social mm -hmm. justice issues, including this one, mm -hmm. talk about what you folks are mm -hmm. doing. Um, well, I'll start with that one because Ford uh, does have a long trajectory in, in uh, workforce development over the last 30 or 40 years and and that focus has shifted as the context of uh, the workforce and the labor market has shifted as well as some of the um, sort of strategies and thinkings within the workforce development field have shifted and I would say since the two early 2000s has has most definitely focused on a sectoral approach of really understanding that is critical to be able to create the kinds of strategies and programs and models that that are particular to a sector because sectors are different and that can bring stakeholders together to come up with really um, good solutions both both for employers and for for workers um, um, and in, in particular labor markets. Over the last few years, actually around three years, however, Ford really shifted a bit in its workforce development focus to really hone in on low wage workers. Um, and that is a broader real commitment to social justice, um, but particularly saying that we, we must particularly focus on, on this growing, growing segment of of our, of our workforce who are low wage workers. Um, and both to focus on the, the emphasis, we have to actually, we have to raise the floor um, for all workers. Um, and, and some of that is through universal strategies and also some focus strategies for those workers who um, have particular needs particular challenges w when it comes to the workforce and labor market and also particular strengths and, 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 um, and assets to offer our economy and our society. So, um, so, so we did that and we are, um, 
we chose particularly to hone in on four important sectors, and some of which um, Steve, uh, Steve uh, mentioned why, but these are four service sectors, and this is actually new for Ford and new within the workforce development focus as well that has traditionally not focused on service sectors because because they haven't traditionally been uh, career pathways or it hasn't been seen as something where um, there's opportunity real for economic security. And Ford's decision actually to say, no, actually we have to. Um, we have to because of the, the broader global economy we're living in, what the labor market looks like in our country and what it looks like on the local level. And that these in fact are, the, they're the growing sectors in our economy. They drive up, they, have the, they drive down. They also have the potential to drive up. And it's where our ch shifting workforce is. And so why this sector, Steve sort of made that argument, is it is one of the, it is one of the largest um, sectors of our, of our time and will only exponentially grow in the coming years. And, and I would argue that we are, we're at a moment right now where we can proactively get at um, what is going to, I think, going to be one of the biggest um, issues around our economy and, and, and workforce to grapple with in the coming years as the baby boomer um, generation is aging and is going to need a workforce that we actually don't, we don't have at this moment. It's going to need a skilled workforce. It's going to need a workforce that actually can provide constant and good care and that actually gets ultimately at, like, at, at the essence of how, how do we want to care for ourselves and our loved ones moving into these next decades. And so I feel like there's an opportunity, particularly with this sector, to grapple around both the issue around this particular sector and the value of care um, um, in, in, our, in our society, in our economy, but that also could have real lessons for other sectors in our economy and could, could really actually show that actually in these low-wage service, low service sectors, there actually is the potential both to raise the floor, but also create really good jobs out of these, long-term jobs, career pathways and career jobs for workers that could actually really also address the issue that we're having of the, the diminishing middle class in this country. So how can these be opportunities that really drive economic opportunity, drive um, economic well-being for all? Thank you. Um, Marky, uh, Steve has described uh, your business uh, My well universe earlier, your business. university. <laughs> um, could you talk about your business, how it grew? And I'd also be particularly interested in, in the whole question of work in this area that's done for cooperatives or not-for-profits versus work that's done for profits and how you can essentially lift up the standards for people in all those, se all those sectors. Sure. So, so my organization, Partners in Care, is a not-for-profit home health care agency. We serve the five boroughs of New York City as well as some of the surrounding counties um, right outside New York City. So we're not in the universe. We are in New York, but we are very large. Um, some people think that's the universe. Well, I'm a Red as Sox a, fan. As though, a New Yorker, so. I do think it's <laughs> so. So we are part of the Visiting Nurse Service of New York, which is the largest home, not-for-profit home care organization in the country. And um, we have employed within our organization 9,800 home health aides and growing. Every single month we're hiring about 370 new home health aides. We have about 300 office-based <coughs> staff that support the, um, the scheduling and supervision and deployment of this workforce. And then we have about 250 professional staff, nurses, physical therapists, social workers who also provide oversight to care. We serve about 8,500 patients every day, and over the course of the year, it's probably about 30,000 patients that we're serving. And as a not-for-profit, when we um, can create a surplus each year, those dollars are used to fund free care for individuals who are uninsured or underinsured. So within our organization, we train individuals who are interested in becoming home health aides. Um, so we have two approved training programs, and we're training probably about 200 of the 370 aides that we hire every month. And these individuals that come to us for training, many have had no prior paid work experience. Um, so many are immigrant workers who are looking for an opportunity. Interestingly, in the last few years with the economic downturn, we've seen individuals coming to us who are educated, who have had prior work experience in industries that have really dried up, and they're looking to get their foot in the door 
in an industry that's growing and healthcare is growing. Um, so they're prepared and willing to take a low paying position just to get in the door so that they can test the waters, move into perhaps you know, a nursing career or some other type of, of healthcare opportunity. So we've had the, the privilege of seeing these um, quality individuals jo join our organization and our retention of these individuals as well as our, our staff in general has been very, very good. We have um, amongst the industry we hear it's about a 60% turnover rate. We're under 25, I think we're like 23%, which still seems very high, but in home healthcare is not very high. It's actually very low. And, and I attribute some of that retention to the work we've done over the last five years in partnership with the paraprofessional Healthcare Institute. Um, about five years ago, we were approached by PHI to work with them in providing training to our, our staff, our office-based staff, in communication techniques, um, listening, um, how to interact with our field staff in such a way that they can feel respected and valued. And over, we've trained all of our office staff. We have since trained about 6,000 of our home health aides in these same techniques. And what we hear from our aides is that they are feeling respected. They feel that someone is listening to them. And the retention rates have improved. The satisfaction rates have improved. And ultimately, which was the premise of the training, patient outcomes have improved. So, so there's been an improvement across the industry um, for us in our portion of the industry as a result of this partnership. So we are grateful to have had the opportunity to work with PHI and continue to look for ways for us to work together to improve the quality of, of the work for these aids. I, I can't resist just quickly asking a question. What percentage of people in this field actually do not have health coverage themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have any, I, I, I'm just sprung yeah, this on you, so I, I'm curious if we have any notion, because it does seem, I, I suspect there's some kind of paradox it's about, it's here. It's about 30%. It's about 30%. Right. So the people who are bringing health care to others, yeah. a majority of them like. There's a fact sheet in the back, back of the room that will give you those kind of basic, basic um, ironic numbers. Yeah, no, that's, um, incidentally, I just want the audience, so I'm going to bring you all in very quickly because most of you are more expert on this than I am. And second, I will have a blatant bias toward the journalists in the front row, partly because I have a blatant journalistic bias, but <laughs> also because I appreciate the fact they might write about this subject, so I'm grateful they're here. Um, is it, what's the case for employers to go the high road? I'd like to ask uh, both Steve and uh, Marky that. What, what's, um, how do you make that case? You're the employer? I'm the employer. Well, you're an employer, too. Yes. <laughs> so, well, you know, by, by paying better, by providing benefits, by providing training that values the worker, you're, you're improving your retention rates. There, there's a financial benefit of doing that. And we're in the healthcare business. We, I feel very uncomfortable not providing health benefits to the employees who we have. It's very difficult. It's a challenge to do this because reimbursement rates are, are very low and they keep getting slashed. So while we continue to try to take the high road, it becomes more and more difficult to do so. And, and, and those reimbursement rates are slashed by insurers, by government, by both? both? By both. The, um, the managed long-term care payers, the um, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursement that is being provided to the organizations that we contract with are, are slashed. And in addition to those costs, the, those reimbursement rates being slashed, the cost to do business keeps increasing because regulatory requirements keep increasing. So not only do we have um, more compliance requirements that we have to fulfill in terms of documentation expectations, but also um, the scrutiny that, that is now on home care agencies by the government because there's been fraud, absolutely there's been fraud. Unfortunately, everyone pays for the fraud of the few. Um, the audits that we have to undergo, uh, it costs money. And so now the money that is limited, that could have been used to help support this workforce is being used to <coughs> respond to investigations. And, and it's very challenging to, to be in this business now and feel like your hands are tied in, in trying to do right by your employees. Mm -hmm. Steve, can you take that up? And, and what yeah. impact has your work over the last, uh, what, 15 years had on other employers? 
Well, the, argue, the first, the business argument, I think it, it differs if you're um, in the private pay market, I think. I mean, and Marky does both kind of work. But if, if I'm paying for home care services that directly from Laney, then I really care about the quality. I'm really going to be looking at that really closely as well as the cost. If I'm paying for Laney to give care to Marky, then I'm, I, you know, I'm the payer, but I'm not receiving the services directly. Um, I'm the government or I'm an insurance company, so I'm a lot more concerned about cost and not quite so concerned about care quality. So, and so much of this industry is in the third party payer system that it really disturbs the, 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 the usual um, purchaser, um, uh, seller um, dynamic and market dynamic. Uh, so it's, it's an easier case, I think, to make in terms of customer service. You know, if you're running a private pay business, you've got a real incentive to make sure that your aides are the very best uh, in order to, to, to bring in that private pay. And the, and the publicly funded, I think it, Marky spoke to it, you know, automatically of we found the most success in those um, agencies where there's a leader uh, like Marky who genuinely cares and wants to, and wants to be uh, the leader of an organization she's proud of that's doing the, the best by her customers, the consumers, as well as her workers. And when you have that kind of leadership at the top, um, then there's other business arguments to make in terms of efficiency and turnover and all. If you're, if you're a leader who is only looking at the bottom line, there's definitely a low road that pays. And it's, it's, a, it's a tougher case to make if, if you're dealing with, a, with leadership that is only looking at you know, making, turning a profit. So, uh, so I think it, it, what we've seen and what we'll be able to see is, is genuine connect, direct connection between the investment in frontline training, higher wages, benefits, better supervision, peer mentor programs, all that kind of work, and, and much lower turnover. And that's the primary you know, financial benefit, as well as once it gets going, uh, you're running a much smoother company. You know, you have fewer problems, you have fewer headaches. Um, you've got a staff that's enjoying coming to work. It's a, a much better do job to have. Hang on just a sec. I want to go uh, to Lane on one thing, and then I'll, I'll come over. Um, Ford is invested in a lot of these efforts. What are you learning from uh, the grants you're making? Well, um, I mean, I think the... the um, there, the importance, as Steve mentioned, of multi-pronged strategies, both to raise the floor um, and to create those opportunities for career pathways, I think is something that's really critical, and particularly in these sectors. One thing that, that, that you just made me think about, Steve, particular to this sector and to another sector we're working in domestic, the domestic work force where it's actually is, 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 is greatly connected to the direct care workforce is that many of these workers of these sectors have actually been fully excluded from the kinds of standards and protections that other parts of our workforce have been. So basic things that we would take for granted like minimum wage and overtime and and I think I can say this here that you know there's been some great strides that the administration has been taken in recent months to try to fix that, the DOL, um, to actually bring direct care workers and some domestic workers actually into the kinds of protections that we have that raise, that actually raise standards and ensure that at least there's a bottom floor. That also, um, I would say for employers, also sort of evens out the, the, you know, what everyone's working on, that everyone needs to at least pay a bottom, uh, the, the kind of minimum wage and overtime. I think that, um, you know, uh, for sure one thing that is important to learn, as I said before, is each sector is different. And so there does need to be some specific strategies and experimentations that, um, that, re that respond to the particular nature of that sector. So as Steve mentioned, the direct care sector is, is so, um, uh, is so intertwined with the kind of public financing and regulations that come both from the state and the and the and the national level that makes it makes uh, makes things more complicated than a sector like the restaurant industry, which is another industry where actually it's fully unregulated, and so the need actually to create the kinds of standards both through policy and through practice, and a lot of that is engaging high road employers to actually show um, to, to 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 try new different kinds 
kinds of practices and then prove, which Marquis does so well, that actually it is, impo it is possible to treat your workers well, um, pay a decent wage, do the kinds of training that actually promotes the kind of um, consistency in a workforce and gives actually fundamental dignity to the workers um, in, in that are part of your business, but to actually show that this is possible um, and that and, and that if, if we can then by show these models, we can actually open up the opportunities for how we can think about sort of recreating a kind of workforce and a kind of sectors that can drive a, a, a more equitable economy um, and an equitable labor market for um, our work. I do think that one thing we're, we're really learning is that there's a need within these sectors to a certain extent, if we call a step ladder, we sort of think about the, the fire escapes that come out of our buildings and, and a lot of the workforce uh, strategies we have start where that ladder starts. If you're anyone from New York, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so this, the ladder starts way up here, and there's a whole range of workers who, who just can't even get to that ladder. And so a lot of what PHI, the Direct Care Alliance, um, other, other um, players are doing out there is actually creating the kinds of ladder that gets workers particularly workers who are not who have particular needs whether it be language whether it be around education whether it be around skills whether it be around um, uh, the uh, different culture that a relationship to the institutions that might be there to provide them resources whether it be voc you know vocational training programs community colleges are out of reach how do we think creatively that deep that that reaches down to those workers and then gets them up to where our ladders start and so that's a lot of the work that we're doing I want to turn to my uh, distinguished colleague from NPR. I want a, uh, uh, and, and when people get the mic, uh, please introduce yourself. And apologies to people who may be watching this online. When I was giving traffic signals, I was trying to get a mic to the front of the room. What I'd like to do is to have you keep in the back of your head for later the question about the tension that we're going to face in government policies, which is, on the one hand, the pressure on government is going to be to cut the cost of health care, and on the other hand, government will ha has, an, I think, an interest in, in the public interest to try to weigh standards and wages. But keep that in the back of your head, please. Hi, Jennifer Ludden with NPR. And just jumping off what you mentioned, Lane, about the De Department of Labor's proposals to extend minimum wage and overtime uh, protections <laughs> to these health care workers, I'm wondering if, Marky and Steve, you think that will proceed as proposed? Do you have any sense? And what impact would it have on the industry? Because while it's aimed at improving the working conditions for the workers, there's concern it could be a strain on employers. And then you hear workers concerned that their hours would be cut so that the employer wouldn't have to pay overtime and, and that in the end they might end up worse off. So m my sense of it is it will pass. And. Um, I think what will happen it is It doesn't exactly need congressional approval, is that right? This is a regulation. It's, regulation. Right. it's a regulation. Yeah. I, it's, it's yeah. I believe what will happen is, since there won't be increased reimbursement, organizations will be cutting back the amount of work that the home health aides are being paid, so that they will try to keep them as close to 40 hours as possible. In my company, we have about 8% of our hours are paid at overtime. And as this, you know, passes, it starts to, sh the, the ability to pay that would, for, for many organizations, would start to, to be difficult. And they'd have to cut back the amount of hours they permit their employees to work. So that with only rare exception, will individuals be working more than 40 hours a week. And is so, that a good trade off? Do you support the changes or not really? I, I, I support it um, in terms of the, the benefit to the worker. I think the unfortunate side of it is the worker's not going to experience the benefit. I, I don't know that the worker is going to come out of this feeling any better. And what we hear from the workforce, as, as, and there's been many studies done looking at the workforce, they don't want this because they believe that their hours will be cut and they'll have to work in multiple agencies to try to get the hours that they need. So, so I think it's, it's a challenge for organizations to pay this. and as return in return, they may not be able to do so. Steve, I got a sense from our conversation coming in, you may have a slightly different right. perspective yeah. on yeah, this. We, uh, we agree on like much <laughs> and disagree on this one. Yes. Uh, although we do, uh, do agree, I, everything we've heard is that um, the administration is, is, is very committed to getting this regulation through out of DOL into OMB and, and off into uh, approval. There's not too many uh, regulations you hear about in which the President of the United States 
you know, announces the changes at the White House surrounded by 20 home care workers. So it's pretty clear that there's a very strong political uh, commitment to this at the White House level. Um, so I, th you know, I think in the end it's, it's going to be an important positive. I think that there's definitely going to be a short-term disruption as there is in any massive system in which you've had a, a, a inequality that's sort of built into the structure. It's built into the, the way financing, the reimbursement structures. Um, and so you can't change that overnight uh, without uh, without having some impact, short, you know, short term or mid term, on both consumers and workers, but in the long term, I think it is going to ad adjust um, positively. You can, you know, the argument that uh, if we can't pay direct care workers overtime because that raises the cost and and that is, we that means we can't have as much service out in the community. You can make that argument about any certainly public service. You can say if we didn't pay. Uh, firemen over time, um, we'd have more firemen on the streets. But, um, you know, the difference between the firemen and the home care worker is mostly, you know, race, class, and gender, right? So um, there's really important uh, way to professionalize this job to say this is real work. This is real work that deserves all the protections that almost all of us all, all um, enjoy. And I don't, because there's going to be an immediate <coughs> um, adjustment is not a reason not to do it. It's a reason to really work hard to make that adjustment as painless as possible um, and to make sure that um, as soon as possible it becomes more the norm. And cooperative, oops, cooperative home care um, does pay time and a half uh, at base wage um, now for its home care workers. Uh, and we still have about 7 or 8% um, over time as well. So I think that initially there might be you know, a real, there will definitely be a, a, a collapsing of, of overtime work, but I think it's going to spring up somewhat over time as the, as the agencies realize that they, they, they're going to need to do some overtime um, just to make it work. Lynn, do you want to cast a tie-breaking tie vote on this uh, <laughs> subject? Um, well, I, you don't I, have to. But I, well, <laughs> no, I, I do think, I think, I think fundamentally, I, I, I obviously um, agree with Steve. Um, because I do think that it is, this is a critical part of our workforce and fundamentally I don't think it is sustainable over time if they are exempt from the kinds of basic standards that, um, that all the rest of us enjoy, um, or the, the majority of workers enjoy. So I do think that um, it's, this is a very important and courageous thing coming out of um, the leadership of Secretary Ilda Solis and, and President Obama, and I do think the call very much is to then how do we work together to both um, uh, support and sustain the workforce and make sure no worker um, wants to lose their job either. And so I think there's some real common interest to figure out how to make this work. Um, but I do think unless there's this kind of regulation put in place, um, we can't dep depend on the, on the labor market to correct that itself. Um, so I think it's a place where policy and regulation is really, really important to even just set the bottom, the bottom floor of what needs to be happening. Briefly before we, we move off, oh, well, you wanted to come back, and I wanted to ask Margie if she's now totally persuaded to the other <laughs> side. Yeah. Well, I, I just want to emphasize that the uh, visiting nurse service in New York is absolutely For the sure. high-end player in the city and the state, and, um, and we've worked together on um, all sorts of training and wage and benefit policy together, and, the, and together, you know, supported what is really precedental in New York State, which is a minimum wage for uh, home care workers um, that, um, that's never happened before in any other state to bring wages, a basic wage floor at least to $10 an hour plus, plus insurance. Um, and, uh, and that's going to put about a quarter billion dollars a year of new money into home care workers' pockets um, when, it, when it's in full force. So it's, it's been a, uh, you know, we, we're, good, we're very good partners in the policy work as well as the practice work. You further thought on this? So philosophically, I support it, just as I supported it when I spoke earlier. I, I do believe that this will have an impact on the workforce. A and I think we have to be realistic about how much the, the industry can support paying this over time at, at the rate that they're paying it today. A and I think, as a result, the workforce will suffer. And, and that's unfortunate, but I think that that's what's going to happen. I want to ask a question to all of you. Anybody can pick it up on this paradox of how do you cut health care? 
cost and how do you help wages in this sector and benefits and training. Uh, if in the meantime, while they're answering, if anybody wants to signal that you want to jump in, I'll just get a mic to Gene, do you want to come in? We'll get one to you. But could you talk about this debate we are now going to have for probably another 20 years at least in our country about sort of how to contain the cost of health care and what that will do to the workers in this sector, whoever wants to sort of stay Well, I would just say quickly that you know, we're experiencing on the ground a really profound shift from reimbursement on the basis of fee-for-service. Every hour you work, you get reimbursed to a managed care environment where an agency or program is given a set amount of money and expected to have certain care outcomes out of that set amount of money, and it's really much more up to the provider, the payer, to figure out how to, how to make that work. And that, that shift of uh, now creating this uh, sort of uh, black box inside of which good guy employers can do some very creative stuff and bad guy employers can do some very interesting stuff as well, um, <laughs> is, is, is shifting, it's going to shift the, that whole question really profoundly. And the good side, the opportunity is that it's an opportunity to begin to redesign the delivery of care in a way that each level of the workforce begins to work at the top of their license, the top of their um, skill base. Right now, we tend to be everyone tend to be working at the at the lower end, and so. What does that mean? It, it means it means that home health aides can do things that can't do things now from a regulatory perspective or from a reimbursement perspective, um, in terms of the, the the type of service that they provide. In terms of uh, depends on the state, they can't do injections, they can't do blood pressure, whatever. You, within a managed care environment, you're going to have a much more of an economic incentive to be, since you're paying for that person already, you know, how can you make the highest and best use of the aid so the nurse can be free to do her highest and best work, so that, she, so that she's freeing up the doctors to do their highest and best work. And I think that's the real opportunity to, to answer that conundrum of, of uh, better qu quality outcomes, but, but at a more efficient, a greater, um, a lower cost overall. And that's the real possibility. Do you think the medical profession will be sympathetic to this shift? Because there is a lot of talk about how physicians' assistants or nurses or, uh, you know, as you go sort of through the healthcare ladder of expertise, you could have a lot more done by people who, in effect, charge a whole lot less per hour to do the same thing. What, what, what do you think the dialogue is going to be like with, the, say, the medical profession on this? Dialogue I use in a sort of an ironic way. <laughs> Well, we know in New York, for example, the state education um, law does not permit home health aides to perform certain functions. And in order for an aide to, to a simple one is um, administering medication to someone who is what's called not self-directing. So someone with dementia, an aide is taking care of someone, they need to have medication. The aide cannot administer medication to that, that person and because it's outside of the scope of practice. And more and more of our, our aging population has dementia, and they are not able to receive the kind of care that they need to get from the home health aid workforce, and the state education law has not been changed to support this. So I don't think it's going to be very receptive because they'll, there's a feeling that jobs will be taken away from the higher paid individuals. Not self-directing. That's a, that may apply That's to all kinds called. of human beings, but yes. all <laughs> us. Uh, uh, <laughs> Gene. So, so I, I have two questions, one substantive and, and one political, I guess. Um, the substantive question is uh, the degree to which you try to recruit uh, youth, particularly disconnected youth, um, uh, the, the fact sheet indicates that the workforce is, I, I guess you would say, sort of middle-aged. Um, and I'm wondering what underlies that. And the, the political question is, um, for, for people like me, 10 years younger, 10 years older, say, say anywhere between 50 and 70, we have either gone through a wrenching uh, period with our parents, we, we know that we are going to go through it, or we know that at some point our children are going to have to take care of us. And you so pray. I, <laughs> I, I, we hope. And, and so I, I'm surprised, I guess, at the absolute silence in the political debate about what seems to me to be an issue that touches virtually everybody. I, you know, you, you never hear anybody talking about it, uh, even at the most 
and we have the level. So those are my questions. Thank you. So at either a glib or a non-glib level, <laughs> who, who, because we were just talking about this before the session mm -hmm. started. Who wants to start on that? Did well, well, I'll, well I'll, I'll speak to the first okay. question sure. about the, so we recruit anyone who is interested in becoming home health aides. And we have individuals, um, the minimum age is 18. So we have individuals as young as 18, and we have individuals who are in their 70s and 80s who come to our door who are interested in being hired as a home health aide and who may need training to become a home health aide. And, and we, we find, realistically, that people in their 30s plus tend to do better and tend to have, um, we tend to have greater retention of that workforce but, but we, do, we, we don't discriminate. Whatever the age is, if, if they're able to pass all of the screening requirements for hire, we will consider them for employment. And our experience is similar at Cooperative Home Care, although we're now finding about 25% of our enrollees are between 18 and 25. The, the age, the, the, they do um, have a little bit harder time because, again, uh, the maturity, you know, you, you need to have a great deal of maturity to walk into a stranger's home and be able to negotiate all these relationships. So I think that's probably the major reason why there's a, it's harder, a little bit harder to retain. But it's still in a very important part of the recruitment. Mm -hmm. On the political side, I, you know, I, I share your frustration, but um, I would say that it's, it is, there is getting more attention. Um, you know, we, we do our, our own sweep of all the news articles in the country. And it is just incredible the amount of coverage locally that's happening on this issue c compared to like five years ago. So it is beginning to pick up. It is just at the beginning. I think one of the reasons why it's still relatively uh, um, hidden away is, is f for the very reason that everyone wants to deny they're getting old or they're going to get sick. Is that all of, all of aging is a hidden issue. Uh, I think it's further exacerbated. I testified to that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, we don't want to admit that that's what that's the end of the story. Um, but that, but the other way it's hidden is that there's an assumption that there's sort of an endless supply of low-income women out there who are, are always going to be available, and that was true for the first you know couple of decades when we were building this system. But if you look at the demographics of the of this last decade of 2000 to 2010, and now this current one, 2010 to 2020. 2010 to 2020, we're going to need a net additional 1.6 million direct care workers. And since this is traditionally a, a woman's occupation, the net additional women entering the workforce during that same 10-year ten, ten period is only 600,000. So and that's we're just and so there's all these other jobs, you know, lawyers and doctors and that women fill as well. So it's there. There is going to be a shift in terms of the we're passing this point in which the supply of workers is going to be relatively restricted compared to the demand that's going to just be. Uh, we were talking this morning, and every day now, uh, every, uh, 10,000 people turn 65 in the country. Could that, by the way, and I want to go to Lane, have any positive impact on wages and benefits? I mean, if there's a scarcity supposed mm. to work, that if right. there's a scarcity well, again, uh, people. It's, it's a problem of if you're in a, if you're in a buyer-seller dynamic that helps, but if you're in a third-party pair, that disturbs that relationship. Mm -hmm. And so it's not automatic. Right? Um, to respond to the last question that, I, that, that um, Ford is heavily invested in, and for me is actually one of the more exciting things on the horizon, and I think it's just coming out and hopefully will gain some attention over this, this next year, is that there has been this formation of a really broad coalition, an alliance uh, that's bringing together folks like PHI and the Direct Care Alliance with um, the, the National Domestic Workers Alliance that's really making the connections that actually it's the domestic workers who are often, as Steve m mentioned, now moving to do a lot of the elder care work and so there's a real connection but largely, uh, you know, uh, in, in the home, a largely um, immigrant women um, and not necessarily connected to this workforce but the great potential of connecting to the workforce with uh, labor unions, both SEIU, AFSCME, AFL um, and, and others with senior uh, with senior organizations, disability rights advocates, um, 
uh, which it's, it's actually, as you said, this is an issue that touches everyone in actually a really deep way and has allowed for folks who haven't been around, who haven't come around the table to come around to the table. And as I said before, for a minute, we have a moment actually to put forward some proactive proposals rather than it will be taken up. It will be taken up within you know, the, the chambers around here and will probably go to a pretty uh, low road place that we have a moment actually to build that kind of coalition that actually connects to the various interests, the interests of the workforce around what kinds of new jobs, what kinds of job, job standards, job training that connects to the interests of, um, of the, the, the folks who need care um, in terms of what kind of care, consistency of care. As, as Steve said in the beginning, the, the, the quality of care is so important in this, maybe than most other sectors. Um, but then also the family members and the folks who are struggling so much to afford the care because of the mess that we talked about, that how do we try to find, um, and, and folks are busily working away on this, many folks in this room, of actually putting together a, a comprehensive proposal that sort of builds from local proposals, state state potential solutions uh, within a sort of a broad and bold um, national uh, agenda. And I would also say connects also to the issues around a largely immigrant workforce and how do you connect workforce training and education to really create pathways for folks to, to, to take, to step into this workforce in a way that they have the kinds of um, proper documentation and whatnot. So I'm hopeful that actually this year we will hear some of that. There are going to be on, uh, in, in cities across the country they're going to be carrying out these local care congresses they're engaging seniors around both this values and this agenda in a really different way in this upcoming year so um, I actually think someone from the care cross generations campaign is here so um, could I just I have two people who want to get in but I just wanted to use what you just said Lane as a transition to something we wanted to deal with which is to have Steve talk about the national and local campaigns in various areas that uh, PHI is involved in. I just think it would be a good time to put on the table. Then I'll bring you both in at the same time. Steve? Well, definitely on the policy side, the Caring Across Generations campaign is really important to, to raise this public voice to join uh, workers and consumers together. That's very important. Uh, we're working with the Weinberg Foundation on a national pilot in New York City on a, that's, that's a pilot on the home care training workforce to to show what are the, uh, the quality standards of what a training program should look like and what an employ employment program should look like. Um, I'd say that the other thing we're doing is, is trying to emphasize what Laney's referred to around raising the floor and, and building ladders that I th we think really strongly that the, the workforce development field and, and the departments of labor at state and federal levels have really overemphasized the career ladder side of the solution. That while that's very important, it really only impacts a relatively small percentage of low income people. And you know, at Cooperative Home Care, there's 2,000 workers. You know, maybe a couple of hundred, maybe have, will have access to a career ladder um, opportunity to to go on to a higher career. But that leaves 90 percent of the workforce um, and you've got to have a strategy of raising the floor uh, so that and there's lots of ways to do that there's these minimum wage laws that making sure there's there's um, uh, health insurance coverage um, better training standards um, you know uh, connections to public benefits there's a lots of different ways in which you can take a bad job and make it better for for hundreds of thousands of workers and there's just been up until recently, when after Laney joined Ford, um, you know now Ford has really been really emphasizing this, these two arms of the strategy, and we think it's just really critical to e emphasize that um, you know the anal the anal analogy would be that in, in, ho in housing, you know that that the success would be to get someone out of the poor community and into a nice home in the suburbs. Well, that's nice for and that's a great story for some. But if that just leaves the, the low-income community as it is, and same with the job strategy. You've got to have a strategy that raises the whole floor. So and now we can all know that we're grateful that Laney joined Ford. Yes. Uh, <laughs> we I have two folks here at the same time. Then I got you over there. So and then we'll do two in the back, and then we'll bring it up to you. If, if, if two people at a time so we can get everybody in. Sure. I'm Ann Montgomery with the Senate Aging Committee, and I'm glad to be here. And I know many of the people in this room, good to see you all. Just want you to know that Congress is not AWOL on this. The Senate <laughs> Aging Committee is your friend. We think about long-term <laughs> care, people with disabilities all the time, and we think about workforce quite a bit. 
and Steve well knows uh, that we worked on some policy that is in the Affordable Care Act, so knock on wood, uh, that will go forward. It, it deals with career ladders for direct care workers. We need to get it funded through the appropriations process. So anybody who knows Tom Harkin or anybody <laughs> else on the appropriations committee, you know, please look at those provisions and advocate for them. And we're trying to build, you know, training standards, which are absolutely fundamental, you know, to raising the floor of, of this profession for personal home care aides who have none anywhere at the right. federal level. Um, so there's really a lot going on. There's a lot to work on today with the tools that we already have in statute. And I just want to make everybody aware of that. So don't feel like there's a void out there. There isn't. And anybody that is interested in taking this work further, you know, come talk to us, uh, as well as, you know, the help committee and, and others of legislative jurisdiction. Okay. Uh, my question is about bringing men into this workforce and how important you think that is. I personally think it's important, but I want to know what your opinion is, all the panelists, and how we can best do that, how you can actually target men if you think that's important. Thanks. Can we go to the second question, too? I think that's a great question. And thank you for your reassurances, by the way. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Schaffer with Caring Across Generations. Thank you very much, um, Lainey, for those comments. And Anne, thank you very much for all of the good work that you do. And I, is this on? Yes. Yeah. So um, I want to also say we do talk to Anne, and we always appreciate that, and everybody else should, too. Um, I was actually, when I raised my hand, we had the word immigration hadn't come up. And I understand from the PHI fact sheets that 23% of the workforce is made up of immigrants. And I just wanted to ask you what we're going to do to, st to stabilize the workforce um, to make sure that people who are doing this good work who may be undocumented um, can continue to do it in a way where they are less vulnerable than they are today. We have some views on that, but I'd like to hear yours. Can I start, can I start with Marky? These questions can be summarized as men and immigrants. Uh. Okay. <laughs> so, so uh, it, interestingly, over the last, I'd say the last five years, we've seen an, uh, an increase in the number of men who have um, applied for and been hired as home health aides within our organization. It, it, there was a rare man in our workforce, and now I would say in every training class of 20, there's probably two to three men, which may not feel like a lot, but there used to be very few. Um, and so I think having men in the workforce is, is a good thing. There still are challenges, though, because um, the female patients and even many times the male patients do not want a male home health aide to provide care to them. So the men have the hardest job getting work. And so it's not impossible, but it takes a lot of convincing to get the patients to be willing to accept a man to provide personal care services to them. And that's it's unfortunate. On either question, um, Steve? Well, we have the same experience, particularly in the, I mean, we work around the country New York is particularly mm -hmm. uh, female focused um, in terms of just the culture of care uh, in, the, in the larger agencies. When you get out more in, in rural areas and smaller towns, there's, much, there's a higher percentage of men. There's a Why higher is that? Well, there's a higher percentage of men in the, in the we found in the workforce in rural areas and no, but why? Well, why? I'm just I, I just think it's more of a there's this greater sense of no, people know each other a little bit more. Perhaps there's a greater sense of safety and community there. Mm. Maybe um, it's just guessing. Um, but um, but also uh, uh, the population in terms of adults with adults with physical disabilities tend to you know they, I think they feel more um, self self directing. They feel more confident with a male worker. There's not as much vulnerability perhaps as an elder woman would feel or elder man. So I think those are, that's where we see more. That's where we get the 80, the 12% that's in the fact sheet of, of men more so. Mm -hmm. Linda, you want to do, take I'll the, do the immigrant question? one? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think for sure, obviously, we need to be working towards a, some kind of a more comprehensive solution around immigration reform. And in the meantime, because um, uh, they're interconnected, these are very interconnected issues, obviously. But in the meantime, we need to be doing all we can to, to really integrate and support um, immigrant workers who are, uh, who are increasingly a huge percentage of our workforce and will continue to be, to have the kinds of skills and opportunities to gain access to better jobs. And some of the ways in which um, we are doing that is um, by supporting uh, uh, programs that are, 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 are programs that are particularly based 
more deeply in immigrant communities. I mean, there's all kinds of barriers, obviously, and so there's um, where there's sort of more connection to the sort of multiple needs of immigrant communities um, that is, is um, doing contextualized learning uh, with immigrant workers, so that's not just as a sort of a move away from just sort of you know, s teaching English um, writ large to actually really sort of teaching the kinds of English skill that are based on the kinds of work skills and thinking about different chunks that helps them in to integrate um, more directly. There's some really wonderful models, one very close to here, Casa de Maryland up in Montgomery uh, in Prince George's County that actually is a really wonderful hybrid between a worker center that they have worker centers, they call them welcome centers throughout the, the state that are based in the in, in in the community where actually largely immigrant communities, some of the largest day labor corners, that can actually bring them into a space um, where they feel comfortable, where they're highly, have high you know, cultural competency, where they're folks they know, where they can give them a number of services, but then have the community colleges, Prince George's Community College is a big partner that are actually doing the kind of training on site in the worker center, rather than the kinds of barriers for immigrant workers transportation wise to, to get to the community college, or even just what it means to walk through a door of an institution that seems either foreign or um, threatening given given the response. So there's a lot of those kinds of experimentations that are happening. A wonderful um, a wonderful model in Chicago, Instituto de Progreso Latino, that is in this sector that which is really thinking about how do you how do you sort of create that the ladders of, um, of particularly uh, Latino workers in Chicago to do the kinds of contextualized learning and do the kinds of skills that actually move them up into that um, from from into the to the LPN and the RNs. Um, so there's a lot of models there. Then I think we have to scale them. And finally, I will say, and this is um, you. This is mm -hmm. this is a, what you all are doing. Is how do we actually think about w while we wait for some kind of more comprehensive response to the situation around. Uh, our immigration laws, how do we actually make some hooks? Because the demand is there, and we were talking about this before. We have, so we need 1.6 million workers. There are 600, what was that, 600,000? So I think there is a demand that, that we're going to have to figure out how to, fulfill, how to fill them, and there's actually a workforce that couldn't be integrated into that. So how do we think about hooks of, of integrating into a workforce where we need to the immigrant workers who need, to, who, who need those jobs? And how do we think creatively um, about then giving them the opportunity and give them the kind of um, uh, papers that they need to, to do that. And I think caring across generations is actually one of the few that I think that are really thinking creatively and proactively about that. Yeah, thank you for that question because these, some of these problems are so hard to solve, but they would be a little bit easier to solve if we could actually do something comprehensive on immigration for sure. uh, reform. We have two patient people in the very back row. Um, so my name is Elaine Weiss, and I work on education, actually, at the Economic Policy Institute. Um, I know I'm very grateful that Elaine's here because she used the term broader boulder, which is actually the name of my campaign, <laughs> which I take as a good sign. Um, the, reason, <laughs> the reason I'm here um, is that one component of education policy that we're working on hard is improving the quality of early care and education. So we're at the other end of the age spectrum, but oddly enough, it shares so many of the issues oh. as elder care. It touches almost everybody. You're either a young kid, you had a young kid, you have young kids who are grandkid, grandchildren, you work in the early childhood sector, very low wage, highly unregulated, it's very isolated, it's a lot of women, low wage women, and we have problems, and like you were talking about, the quality of the care itself is number one, number two, and number three in terms of the importance of it, and it matters to our society. The question I want to pose to all of you is, we've been trying to think creatively about how do we message this? How do we c get it to come across that this is important and that we shouldn't be, basically what we're doing right now is debating between being a burger flipper or being a, an early childhood care. I mean, is that really the importance that we place our children in? That's what we do in terms of economics. So the question to all of you, and it was touched on before is, what space is there in your sector and in our sector to message that this is an important way to improve and resurrect the middle class and create middle class jobs. Because um, that's kind of the way that we're approaching it and I think there are commonalities here. Thank you, hold off on that, what a great question. This is a really cool audience, uh, <laughs> please. Yeah, my question is related. Um, looking at the, the parallel of the early childhood system, there's been a lot of work on career ladders um, in that sector. And the way it's being discussed here, it seems to me, as someone who doesn't know this field all that deeply, is that a career ladder 
is means moving up into a different job, like going from a home care worker to become a CNA. Whereas in the early childhood field, through programs like Teach and Wages, they've created systems where you stay in the same job, but by improving your levels of skills, you get can get wage subsidies that are publicly and privately funded. Um, as a, and it's a way to um, retain qualified workers since retention is so important yeah. in that field. And so I just wonder if anything like that is at all possible. It sounds like if you're expecting wage subsidies to come through increased medical reimbursements, that's never going to happen. But can we think about it as a workforce development strategy where we could be um, subsidizing employers to provide those ladders within a specific job? Thank you. Who, who wants to? So we have explored the career ladder approach that you describe, and, and we keep coming back to the same issue of if reimbursement is being made by third parties, there isn't money there to be able to pay more. So we've done things like training aids, specific skills to work with um, individuals, for example, with the hospice population, with the, the, the terminally ill, and we provide specialized training and specialized skill, and, and they work predominantly with that population. And while we've done more to enhance them and enhance their role, the money isn't there to be able to, to provide greater payment. So they can feel good about what they've done, but they don't see anything more in their pocket. And, and that's a challenge. And this is where perhaps, if things go right, uh, managed care reimbursement can change that dynamic. Because right now, you're paid just for the number of hours you provide for a particular type of worker. If you're now soon to be paid on the, with a global payment, then you can decide, well, we're, we're, we're only gonna, um, we're, we only have to bring the nurse in once every month, rather than once every two months. We've got more money there to spend. We can adjust the role of the aid to be more of a senior aid. You know, so there's, there may be within this box of managed care reimbursement chances to build those Matters. Right now, though, particularly in, in long-term care, there are very few rungs. There's a low rung, and then there's an LPN, and between the home health aid is two weeks of training, and LPN is at least a year of college, and that educational leap is gargantuan for yeah. most people. So, um, so what we're trying to do is identify advanced aid roles where uh, you don't have to go to college, um, but there's lots of really important uh, responsibilities and skills that are, are, can be embedded in the middle middle rung there at least. So uh, what, was the, what was the education? What was the first question? What was your, I can only remember one question. I'm wondering how you can, well, thanks. I'm wondering what role you think the message of kind of resurrecting a middle class and of creating, not just creating jobs, because you all talked yeah. about this challenge. We are creating some jobs, but we're creating a lot of bad jobs. Right. How do we re-emphasize that we need to create good jobs so that we're not, you know, racing to the bottom? Well, if you're in a particular industry like like education, early childhood education, you've got to have good models. I mean, I think if you're trying to, you can't just be saying these are great, you know, come, you know, join this workforce, it's a wonderful job, and then they get there and it's a terrible job. So, um, so you've got that's to. That's happened before. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a lot of the work that we've done, you know, is to create good models where you take the best uh, that you possibly can of the limited resources you got and really show what is possible. I, I would, I would, Happy to talk with you after. I would be a little bit careful about this middle class argument. Um, I think the, what's achievable and really important um, is for these hundreds of thousands of jobs, of work, work women in these jobs, millions of women, they're not necessarily going to be middle class, at least as we understand it. But, but the difference between you know, either being on welfare or patching together a few jobs and making, maybe making seven or $8,000 a year and making $20,000 a year and insurance, that's not a middle class job, but it is a hell of a lot better. It's just genuinely meaningful. So I would, I would, everyone, you know, I know that the middle class is the political phrase, but I would uh, like to come up with something that's, mm -hmm. that's different and more powerful for that, that would actually, we could deliver on. Lenny, can I ask you to hold to the okay, next round? Fine. You'll go first, because there are three people I see, and then several other, uh, the, the gentlemen in the back. So let me, could I have three now, since that we, we can keep doing this as the time runs out, over here, and then this gentleman, and then the lady over there, and then I'll go to the back of the room. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, my question actually builds off of what you were just talking about. And one of the challenges that direct care workers, and especially home health workers face, is 
earning family sustaining wages because of the fact that so many are only employed on a part-time basis or are only able to get part-time hours. And what I was wondering is how you see that being turned around. And particularly, Marky, I was wondering, with your retention rates, is your workforce composition different? Do you employ more of your workers on a more full-time basis than part-time basis? Thank and, you. And then this gentleman, I must say, I love hearing the term family sustaining wages. It goes back to the very old concept of the family wage, which we used to talk about as about 100 years ago. Uh -huh. And it's just a very important idea. Uh -huh. uh, sir. And then to the lady right behind you, you can pass it back to me. My name is George Safakis. I'm the CEO of Excella, and we represent HOSA, Future Health Professionals, here in Washington. I'd like to follow up on the youth strategy. Uh, HOSA is an organization that has 150,000 students this year, 47% minority participation, and is the only organization pre-post-secondary that is all healthcare, heading into the, all of the allied health professions. Mm -hmm. And so youth strategy is extremely important. HOSA is growing yearly 10, 20 percent, but it's clearly not enough. We need a larger pipeline, and I'm wondering what you all think in terms of the youth strategy, how can we expand and multiply and leverage the pipeline that's already in place? Thank you. And then over here, and I promise, sir, we'll get to you before we close. Hi, my name is Judy Berman. I'm with DC Appleseed, and we've been working on this issue locally um, here in DC, trying to raise the floor um, on the direct care profession. And I have a couple of two questions. Um, one is about the relationship between the CNA and the home health aid. We haven't talked about certifications, mm -hmm. and one of the issues that we've been working on here is recognizing, as you were talking about earlier, Steve, the very unique setting that home health workers are in, and yet it seems that a lot of states are really focusing on the CNA mm -hmm. and using that as the building block. Um, and just sort of wondering what you think about those two is how comparable I mean, the relationship between those two fields and whether there's growth potential um, or opportunities for thinking differently about what, what the fed, basically what's, what's been created at the federal level, the CNA is the one that's kind of endorsed. Um, and the other question I have is whether or not you're aware of any research that's been done, and do, you, you mentioned it sort of anecdotally that, you're, that the outcomes improve for your patients when you implement the sort of high road employer, em, employee standards, um, and employ, I'm sorry, working conditions. Um, is that documented anywhere, and if so, or is it, you know, how do we, how do we tap into that as an argument for better outcomes through, I mean, I know PHI sort of is that kind of thematically where you are, but is there research that we can point to um, to make that case? You want to do a division of labor on each of the three or? It's four. Lainey, I promise Lainey first. Yeah, no, and I actually will probably cede my time to these two because I think those are much more specific questions for them. One thing I just wanted to say about the sort of moment to sort of to push out into the narrative the question of value of care and care a care care work across the spectrum from child care to to elder care um, that that I do think there's a number of folks who are grappling with how to how to how to how to, how to you know how to take leverage the most opportunity we have and uh, and um, for sure you know within the care across generations the, there's the spectrum between domestic workers who are doing both and the and the direct care workers um, and they're doing a lot around messaging and framing um, I think that they're focusing more on this the, on the elder care but their vision and ambition is most definitely to make the link and so I would just encourage um, encourage a connection there if EPI is focusing on that to, to connect with the folks in the room there because I actually do think this tension around do we frame it around a middle class conversation or do we frame it differently I think is one we need to take up together because otherwise I think it ultimately ends up uh, uh, you know not serving us well so um, and I'm not if Ford is right there in the middle of it too trying to figure that out so um, I, I would say I would say the more specific questions I'll see to these folks okay so so I'll start with your question about our, how our work composition happens. So um, our aides are all hourly employees, so they get paid for however many hours they work. On average, our home health aides work about 32 hours per week, but that's a pure average. We have some aides who are working 84 hours a week, and we have some aides that are working nine hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, of their ability to work closer to that 30 to 40 hours depends on the aides' flexibility. So they'd have to be willing to work, you know, multiple patients over the course of a day. Um, they need to be willing to work weekends. 
not necessarily every weekend, but weekends, in order to be able to pick up the hours. So we do work very aggressively to try to maximize the amount of hours that every one of our home health aides works, if that's what they would like. There are some who are very happy to be working 20 hours a week. It works for their family life, but we do want to try to um, provide opportunity for those aides who do want to work full time. I think there are models that still need to be explored where we can find um, ways to test the ability to give full-time work to home health aides, but, but those models, we really need to find funding opportunities to test these models. So with new reimbursement streams, maybe we can try to provide um, full-time work to aides who maybe have a, a caseload of a number of patients they see over the course of the day, rather than prescribed hours per patient per day, which is the way the, the industry is currently uh, modeled. So I think that we, we need to be able to test these new ways of doing, of providing care so that we can see if there is an opportunity to provide full-time work, keep costs down, um, and still create good opportunities for the workforce. Steve? Uh, we're relatively fortunate in New York because we have, both of us, because we have a, a you know, pretty sophisticated, um, highly uh, sophisticated um, transportation system, public transportation, and a very uh, dense population. So it's actually relatively easier for us to work in New York to get to patch together full-time work. We also have a, a relatively, even though we complain about it all the time, compared to the rest of the country, we have a relatively generous home care benefit in the, in the state. So there's a lot more home care hours per client than most parts of the country. There's a lot of work that has to go into creating an agency that is trying to intentionally maximize full-time work, and that's what we do. We average about 36 hours a week, but with the same requirements of flexibility. Uh, we're a little more neighborhood, I mean, par partners is across the, the universe. universe. <laughs> Thank you. And, and, we're, and we're pretty much focused in the South Bronx, so <laughs> that helps too. Um, but I think maybe an ironic uh, result of the, uh, of the, of the overtime uh, exemption locking in is right now you've got a kind of a bimodal, you know, lots of part-time, lots of overtime, and maybe it will get pushed more into the middle when, when agencies can't afford or decide not to afford to do as much full-time work. So I think that might be one benefit of that. Um, but it is, it, it, it's a big problem rural in, in more rural communities. Um, it, it does require a really different type of, um, of uh, clustering, uh, you know, tr trying to figure out uh, um, how you can, s a cluster of AIDS can serve as a particular re geographic region. Uh, but it, it's a, it, there's no easy answer. We've, we've tried a lot. Um, but it, it's critical because, uh, you know, we're, we're talking, the difference between a buck or two an hour is important, but but the difference between working 18 hours this week and 40 hours next week and 13 hours the next, that's what really kills you. That's what makes it a very difficult, uh, unstable job. That's one benefit of the <coughs> nursing home, you know, more, more facility-based care is it's regular work. But I interestingly enough, the turnover in nursing homes is higher mm. than oh. it is in home care. Because mm. it's just that much. I promise that gentleman, and we've gone over time, so I'll uh, have him ask his question, and then oh. I'll Although just we, go. we do have several questions. And that what I was going to say <laughs> is. The stack up for you. Yeah, so we, I, I met LaGuardia. Um, <laughs> the, um, what, what, what I'm going to do is bring that gentleman in, and then in closing, you can clean up right, all of the questions that, that uh, we have confronted. <laughs> but I had kept saying I would call on him, so, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Herudian with Senior Service America. We're a national grantee for the Senior Community Service Employment Program. Uh, one of the things that's been discussed here is about, you know, 10,000 people turning 65 every day, uh, but they're not, uh, they're not likely to be any of, uh, they're not the major group of clients, uh, nor are most of the boomers today or in the next five or 10 years. Their parents may be, yeah. and some of those people who are turning 65 today uh, may be instead of your clients, they may be some of your employees. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what are you looking at, and, and we've done some research ourselves that we've sponsored, showing that most providers are very amenable to hiring older workers. A lot of older workers prefer, especially if they're looking for a second career or re-entering or something else, uh, in, a, in a kind of partial retirement situation, they wouldn't mind working part-time and, and Third, we found that among uh, a sample of CSEP participants, about 20 to 25 percent uh, would be interested in paid work 
doing the kinds of things that home health care aides or personal care aides do. Uh, what do you see in the future, or do you yourself uh, recruit older workers? I think that's a, a, a possible resource. Thank you. And what I'm going to do is go uh, Marky, Steve, and Lainey, and I'll have Lainey close because she is now single-handedly responsible for funding <laughs> all of the good ideas that has, have emerged uh, in this uh, discussion. I'll uh, have to make a note around <laughs> partnerships there. <laughs> <laughs> So, so if I remembered the various <laughs> questions, I'll start with yours first about the, um, the, over, the 65 overworker. So we actually love hiring what we call the mature workforce. And we have partnered with the New York, um, State, um, New York City Department um, Human Resources Administration, which has a mature workers program. And we are the largest um, employer hiring this mature workforce. So we find that that population is the most stable. Um, our clients are most satisfied with a, a mature worker, which is what they call them. Um, and so it is ideal. A and, and you're right. They, they, it's, for many of them, they are individuals who are ending one career and entering a second career. So that is a great opportunity for us. Going to the other spectrum, your youth question. Um, I think some of what needs to happen to get the youth to work in this industry and do it successfully has to do with more job readiness. Um, I find that, that, you know, I mentioned earlier, the turnover is much higher um, and we get the most um, complaints and problems from our patients when they have a young home health aide who, you know, there's a lot of texting on the cell phone um, when they should be working. And, and their, the maturity Anybody in knowing them? how to um, work with the senior is very difficult. So I think if there's more done in the way of job readiness, that might be helpful. Um, in terms of the CNA versus the home health aide piece, we actually get many CNAs who come to us to be employed as home health aides. CNA? As a certified nurse's aide. So those are the individuals who generally work in a nursing home providing personal care services. You would think that would be a much more valuable job. Steve mentioned there's higher turnover there. Many of those people come and, and they're going to make less money working as a home health aide. But, but they in fact come and are looking for jobs in, 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 in that arena. And finally, the outcomes piece, PHI actually has a, a research team that has done work on, on the outcomes. So I'll let Steve answer. Well, we can just direct you to that. There's, okay. th th it's, hard, it's harder to make that case uh, directly because there's so many other factors, but we've, got, we've collected the best there is, so we, we can get that to you. I would say on the, on, on the, the different age spectrums. We've worked with the CSEP program of elders. We've worked with the youth, but we're working with youth build in, in New York. Um, uh, so it's going to be all hands on deck. I mean, we're going to need all of these solutions, right? Uh, I would just, I, I, what we found is a difficulty is having programs that, that have to only train youth or only train older, that's not the way employers think. Employers mm -hmm. need everyone, they, they, they need a breadth of workers. Um, so you just have to try to figure out ways to make sure you're blending your particular cohort of age group, either elder or younger, or, or only men, or you know, whatever it is. I recognize that from an employer perspective, that's not how we think, that's not how it works. Um, so, on the other hand, if it's going to be an essential part of the solution, then it's a question of what types of additional supports different types of workers need. So, elder workers, there may be, you may be considered about uh, the physical strain of this work at home, um, uh, other issues of, of a mature workforce for youth is, is uh, pre-employment training, uh, support emotionally, that kind of, you know, there's, so there's ways in which a, it, what it requires is fairly large organizations and fairly centralized training capacities. Because if you have each little home care agency trying to do this, they are not going to be able to give that kind of specialized support. Um, so I, I see a consolidation of training systems over time that are going to be able to feed directly, work directly with employers to be able to blend those different needs because we're going to need a lot of people. Okay. Um, since you brought up the funding piece, I think that... Uh, <laughs> Everybody uh, does that with you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's such a surprise. Um, um, I, I mean, I think that the... Um, one thing that I think this sector particularly, but all of the sectors we're working in, which is really critical, is around how do we sort of 
uh, get out of the siloed uh, nature, perhaps, of how we're thinking about both the workforce and, and low-wage worker issues. And, and I think that one of the challenges with the workforce development system is that it's a system that, that hasn't necessarily acted as a system rather that, that, that can be rather siloed. And I think how do we then try to figure out how do we bring forth the, the various sort of institutional uh, resources that perhaps exist but perhaps might uh, not be as uh, re responsive and, 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 and flexible enough to meet the challenge of this time, but then really support the kinds of innovations and experimentations and models that are happening within the sector or within regions, um, and then think about how do we shoot them out? How do we communicate them out? How do we try to scale them up? Um, and I think that's not going <laughs> to happen only with Ford Foundation involved. I think um, the... Uh, <laughs>